think we are live. Hey there, church family. Uh, Pastor Jacob here with Eternal Church, and I'm back for another midweek meal prep um, because man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And if you weren't able to join us last week, the whole idea behind this little experiment is to um, kind of flip the script on what is normal for us at Eternal. Um, we typically uh, listen to a sermon, and then in our community groups the week after that, we kind of talk it over. How do we apply this? What are the implications in my life? And that's great. Um, my community group does that too, but we recently have been experimenting a little bit as a community group, and we've been asking the question, well, what if we just read ahead? What if we um, got the scripture ahead of time, and we were able to go ahead and read for ourselves and ask questions about the the scripture, about the original context, and about potentially... Um, what kind of a what kind of a lens we bring to the scripture that could either help us or hinder our ability to understand it. So um, the purpose is um, not really just to kind of geek out, but um, to really be in line with the vision of the church and to help you, the church. Um, if you remember our kind of four coordinates, the things that are most valuable and that we're most passionate about. Um, we treasure the truth. Uh, we treasure the gospel, God's story. Uh, we, we worship Jesus Christ in word and in deed. Uh, we grow in communities of faith. And then we uh, put all those three together and we live lives of witness at work, at life, and at play. Um, and so that's kind of the big idea uh, behind everything that we do. But this particular uh, way of exercising it with these midweek um, meal preps is just to really focus on the truth, getting you engaged with the Bible. It's great to hear from Don or John MacArthur or John Piper or Tim Keller, all great uh, expositors, all great preachers, but this is God's word for you. And so my heart was just to uh, help you to get into this mammoth book called Genesis with all 50 of its chapters and um, to really kind of divide and conquer, ask the questions about the different parts that Don may not get a chance to go into on any given Sunday, uh, and really to help you engage with God as, uh, as an individual or as a family. So I hope you're grabbing some lunch right now, and you can go ahead and grab your Bible, and let's get into it. Um, so there's this guy that uh, when I went to seminary, uh, Gordon Conwell, Haddon Robinson was a big deal. Uh, he uh, He's kind of like a godfather of, of modern preaching, and he wrote this book. Where is it? It's called Biblical Preaching. Ah, here it is. Um, and this is kind of how they schooled us for getting ready to do a sermon. And uh, got a chance to meet him before he passed on, and just a great guy. Um, but he kind of breaks down this, this great task of sermon preparation into ten steps. And real quick, they are start with a passage, select the passage, study it, discover the exegetical idea, which is kind of like the, the big idea of any given passage of scripture. The author who wrote it uh, had some idea in mind, whether it was just a sentence or a paragraph or an entire chapter, there was some driving idea behind why uh, he wrote it. And so what, what was that in the mind of the original author? And then from there you analyze it, you, you kind of mull it over, and you come up with a homiletical idea, which the way I like to think of homiletics is kind of bringing it home. Like that was the exegetical idea was what it meant then and there, but how do we bring it home and make it easy to understand for us here and now? So we, we kind of dress the exegetical idea in, in modern phrasing and modern ideas. Um, determine the sermon's purpose, decide how you're going to accomplish that purpose, whether it's to inspire, inform, um, I think that there's probably another couple of them, but um, what is it that you're doing? Are you informing? Are you inspiring? Are you challenging or convicting? Um, and then you outline it, and you fill in the outline with um, support, uh, stats, stories, and ultimately, you prepare the introduction and conclusion. So that's a little behind the scenes of sermon prep. I always say you've got to preach it to yourself as well before you get in front of anybody else. Make sure that it's something that's really sunk into your heart. We can't do all that uh, in uh, this midweek meal prep. Um, and really what I want to do is just focus on the first three for y'all because anybody 
can do these. You don't have to be a seminarian. Uh, if you are a follower of Jesus, I would say you are a theologian. You think of Theo, God. You think of, of, of what it means uh, for the scripture to penetrate your life and transform who you are. So you are a theologian. And you can select a passage to look at. You can study it. And you can try to figure out what was the original author's idea of this passage. Why did he write it? So that's all we're going to focus on for this time together, is selecting the passage, study the passage, and discover the big idea. And the cool thing is, we don't really have to do much for the first one. Um, in selecting the passage, you always are going to be looking for a, a basic uh, biblical unit of thought. Typically, um, when you go for the shortest verse of the Bible, Jesus wept in John 11, it's kind of hard to, to know exactly what you're talking about because it's so short. And so when you're looking for selecting a passage to, to study or to, to preach on or just to understand in your devotional, you want to get the, the, the smallest logical biblical unit of thought. Um, this could be a couple of sentences, a paragraph, maybe even an entire chapter, but you want to make sure it's a single unit of thought. Um, a lot of times it's a paragraph, sometimes it's an entire chapter. Today we're going to be looking at Genesis 3 verses 7 through 24. Uh, Don went ahead and did the heavy lifting for us. We already uh, hung out in Genesis 3 last week, but we're going to go ahead and stay there. Don kind of talked about what happened, and then this week he's talking about the fallout of the fall or the consequences of falling. So that's what we're going to look at today together. So for the first thing, check, we've got our, we've got our passage selected. So let's go ahead and read it together. Genesis 3, verses 7 through 24. This is coming from the ESV. Then the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened. And they knew that they were naked. This is right after they had just eaten from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat by the plants of the field, and by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. I may be interrupted in a second by FedEx or UPS, so if so, excuse me. This is real life at the office. The man called Eve's, or the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand, and also of the tree of the light, the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. 
he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. So, select the passage, study the passage, discover the exegetical idea. So we got through selecting the passage, that's Genesis 3, 7 through 24, most of chapter 3. Um, and now we get to study it. Now, where do you begin? Um, there's kind of a long list in Haddon Robinson's book of all the different things you can do, but I think it's a little bit easier just for you and I to focus on three big uh, places to focus, three worlds. The world behind the text, the world within the text, and then the world facing the text, our world today. So we're going to go one at a time, and maybe you can start using these phrases when you come to the Bible, just so you realize that it's not just the words on the page, it's also the background for the person who wrote those words, the understanding of that person's uh, life, culture, society, uh, because that all went in. The words that he chose actually were culturally relevant back then, but they not, might not be now. And then within the text, what's actually there? There's verses 7 through 24. What do we see there? And then what do we bring today? What's our lens that we view the text today, facing the text? So first we begin by studying the passage behind the text. This would be the original context. And it's kind of difficult when we're in Genesis, just to call this out up front. Um, scholars look at chapters 1 through 11 of Genesis as prehistory, as in prehistoric, there were no written records up until about the time of Abram or Abraham in chapter 12. And so all of this was really transmitted by an oral tradition. Um, which was completely normal. Instead of having newspapers, magazines, radio shows, um, stories and facts really would be told um, by word of mouth. And that was not only acceptable, it was more trustworthy than anything written down. There was actually a distrust of anything <laughs> other than somebody telling you, uh, somebody speaking it, somebody sharing it verbally. And so that was their culture. This is also in the ancient Near East. This is not you know, New York City. This is not uh, Austin, Texas. This is probably Egypt or in the area between Egypt and Israel known as the Sinai. It's a mountainous, hilly re region. I've, uh, I've been there. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but from the pictures I've seen there, this looks very much like that. It's very arid, very dry. Um, there's not a lot of life there. And so that's the original context um, that this was was written in. Um, and we don't really know, see, this is the thing about prehistory. We don't even really know the, the author. It doesn't say at the beginning of Genesis, I, Moses, wrote the, all this down like Paul does in the New Testament where he says, you know, Paul, an apostle, um, you know, to all the saints in, in uh, Corinth. You know, he doesn't kind of call out in the beginning, it's anonymous. Most scholars believe that probably it is Moses who who compiled this, but if you think about it, we're not saying that Moses was there in the beginning. This is not an eyewitness account. Um, there's generations that passed uh, until Moses actually shows up in the story on earth in Deuteronomy. Um, so there's a lot going on, or Exodus, but there's a lot going on here. Um, that requires us to say we we don't know for sure and we're basically having to go uh, based on uh, historians, based on scholars, based on archaeologists and our best guess is that Moses probably was the one that compiled all of these oral tradition stories and then the accounts uh, and he wrote it all down and so that's the context so Moses is maybe the author probably the author and who's he writing this to? Who's he speaking this to? Who's he sharing it to? Our best guess, again, he doesn't state any kind of an audience up front, um, so our best guess is those, um, those people in Exodus, out of Egypt, to the future promised land. So they're in the wilderness, 
and Moses is, is telling these stories to these people who have been taken out of Egypt. They've been delivered. They've been rescued. But they don't even know the God who rescued them. Um, they, they kind of forgot about the things of God over a period of 400 years. And so um, one of the big hypotheses is that Moses is really telling these stories to tell his people who they are. He's kind of giving this picture of, of prehistory of how the world came to be and the God who built it, who made it, and what happened when mankind disobeyed him. And so that's where we are. That's the original context. Again, the original community, probably Moses speaking to those, uh, those Israelites on the Exodus, um, getting out of Egypt. And it was spoken. Um, it was not written down. This was not kind of a telegraph or the World Wide Web. Uh, this was originally a, a, a spoken uh, medium. So that was the world behind the text. Really, really abbreviated. Um, if you want to find out more about that world, I would say look in your Bible if you have a study Bible. A lot of times right before you get into a book there will be a short little introduction on that book. I'm sure there's an intro on Genesis, whichever Bible you've got. Um, I'm using an archaeological study Bible from uh, I guess the NIV. It's old school. Um, but then there's also another couple great uh, resources. There's one called How to Read the Bible Book by Book. Um, and this is like a nice little synopsis, nice little snapshot of each book where they give a little summary of the date, the author, the audience, the occasion for writing. And so um, definitely check that out for the background. But then we move from behind the text to within the text. So forget about the backdrop. Just focus on whatever the Bible says right in front of you. Who are the characters? What's going on? The, the, the plot. So we've got God, obviously, who created everything, and then he creates Adam, and then from Adam he creates the woman, and all of a sudden in chapter 3 we have uh, a serpent. Could you call trees um, characters? I don't know, but you've got a tree of life, you've got a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, so there's all these different characters. And then by the end, you've got something called cherubim, like angels that are guarding the garden. And speaking of the garden, that's the setting. So we're in the Garden of Eden, the original setting, the original context where our story begins, where Adam has been told, you've got to go and work this. Uh, you've got to name all the animals. So they're kind of at home base. They're, they're, they're at home with God, and everything is good until this chapter 3 happens. Um, and the plot, obviously, they have a command not to eat of the fruit, uh, and they disobey. And then God confronts them, and uh, things get messy real quick. So, again, just thinking about the text right in front of you, this might feel a little bit technical, but you're going to appreciate it later. Are there any literary devices? This probably feels like 7th or 8th grade. What's a literary device? Like metaphor, <laughs> simile, repetition, uh, contrast, symbolism. This is pretty much straightforward narrative. It's not very poetic like uh, chapter one of Genesis was. This is really just telling a story. It's kind of like a, 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 a third person narrator just telling you what happened in the garden, moving the plot along. But it is an awful lot of God's voice. Um, I would say it's probably equal parts. So you're, you're told what happens and then God actually speaks a majority of the time in the response of, of based on what happened, based on the failure of Adam and Eve um, and the deception of the serpent, God actually pronounces a whole bunch of stuff. So we've got God's voice, um, nothing real special that I can see about grammar and style, but those are the things you have to keep in mind. Um, is there simile? Is there metaphor? Is there repetition? I don't think so. Um, but maybe you found something that I don't. Let's see. The MVP. When you're looking at the text, what's the most valuable picture? Like, what's the... If you had to boil it down to, like, the Academy Award-winning moment in this passage that, that, that everybody gets to see the little snippet of at the Academy Awards, what's the image that really stands out that defines this whole scene? 
I would guess it's probably God starting to pronounce things, starting to pronounce a curse on the serpent, pronouncing multiplying pain during childbirth for a woman and the fact that she's going to have this weird relationship with her husband and, and pronouncing to the man that because of what you've done, not I'm going to curse you, but I'm cursing the ground that you're supposed to work. And now as a consequence, you're going to have to work that cursed ground. You're going to have to toil. You had it easy, but now you don't. So that, to me, it's kind of like God has this monologue um, where he is pronouncing the aftermath, the fallout of their disobedience. That would, to me, be the most vivid picture. Let's see, key words, phrases, or concepts. Um, we can do this with English Bibles. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's a great place to start for most of us. But you probably are going to be at a little bit of a disadvantage if you don't have any frame of reference for Greek in the New Testament, Hebrew or Aramaic in the Old Testament. Um, you can look at words, phrases, or concepts that either stand out, like, wow, that's that's weird, um, or that are confusing. So the idea of a fig leaf, I'm not even sure if I'd be able to identify what a fig leaf looks like. How much does that cover? That seems like it'd be an uncomfortable uh, wardrobe choice. Um, cherubim, like we said, they were going to have flaming swords guarding the, 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 the garden um, when Adam and Eve are expelled. What does a cherubim look like? Like, I don't even know is it an angel? I, I need to do a little bit more homework. I, I would want to actually look up in a commentary or a Bible dictionary what is a cherubim? Um, what are some other things? When God's talking about us, when he says now that they've eaten, they'll, they, 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 they know everything like us. How does that make sense? And how do th other theologians and Bible scholars address that issue of kind of the, the royal we? God is talking, but somehow talking in, in like a, a second person, like saying, or not second person, first person plural. Man, I just went back to grammar right there. Um, anything that confuses you, these are things that you are going to want to identify and ask these questions ahead of time in order to figure out what the original author's big idea was. Because if they confuse you, that could mean that we just have a breakdown in the context, the original audience from where we are today. You, and they're very good questions, so make sure you write them down. Um, and there are places you can go, Bible dictionaries, atlases, commentaries, annotated Bibles, study Bibles, and you know, good old World Wide Web. All right, what do we read in the text that points to historical, social, cultural, political, religious references? Well. Not much in this passage because it's so new. Like we're still three chapters in. We're at the very beginning. There is no backdrop. We're still in the Garden of Eden. So um, there's not a lot of social references, cultural references. This is like the first culture. There's not a political system. Uh, and there is no religion because they're together with God. Everything is purpose. They're perfect. There is no history because this is the first days or ages or whatever you want to look at it, th these are the first moments that we read about mankind. Um, so there's not an awful lot that we read that references a point in history other than the beginning. Who speaks and who is silenced? Um, again, these are questions not just for our passage, but kind of any time that you read. You know, what is the author saying? What's the author talking about? Um, in this passage, God is speaking like half the time, and he's asking a few rhetorical questions up front. Where are you? As if he doesn't know. And, and did you do that thing that I told you not to do? Kind of like a parent talking to a child. Um, but then the majority of the time, he's pronouncing a curse or a consequence on the disobedience. And mankind is silenced. The serpent is silenced. Um, the serpent becomes very, very quiet after he succeeds in leading in this deception. Um, but man, man and woman are are put in their place. They're silenced, and um, yeah, it's it's a sad scene. When you read over it and you know it so well, it can be it can be real easy just to look at it as kind of like a a cardboard cutout or what do they call them? Like those uh, flannel. Um, 
black flannel boards where you put up those characters to tell a story. You can kind of gloss over the significance, but this was a heartbreak. It was a heartbreak of God and mankind, you know. It was a breakup and um, the expulsion, you know, painful on both sides. I'm, I'm speculating, but it, it was a big deal. It's, this is an epic moment, just three chapters in. And finally, the original languages, I kind of pointed to that before, like it's good for you to go ahead and pick out words that might not make sense to you in English, um, but it wasn't written in English originally. This was written in Hebrew. And if you look at the Hebrew for our passage and you don't have any frame of reference for Hebrew, it's scary. You have to read it backwards. Um, I think that there's a lot to be gained, not just from, from reading and knowing the original language, but hearing it. Because again, remember, this was an oral tradition. And so the, the first people didn't actually see it and read it, they heard it. And so a lot of um, jokes and kind of puns, Tom Harvey would love the Hebrew language because um, there's a lot of play on words. There's a lot of um, words that sound like one another. Uh, especially when you start having the word surely in English show up, like when God says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbirth, that surely wasn't actually there in the Hebrew. It was the word multiply twice. It was, I will multiply, multiply your pain in childbirth, just with a slight little variation on the way that the word was constructed. But it's what they're really saying is like, I'm going to mega multiply your pain in childbirth. Not surely doesn't do it justice, but those Hebrew words were very similar, one right after the other, and so it's something that the original audience would have gone, oh, that's a lot of pain. Not just surely, that's like mega childbirth pain. Um, you miss some of that stuff if you don't have that frame of reference. So if you want to get crazy, there are places where you can go and listen, just listen to the Hebrew Bible version of this. I did that this week. I uh, just did a Google search for Hebrew Bible version of Genesis 3, and uh, you can listen to it. Um, not for everybody, but if you are so inclined, um, it's a great way to kind of have a respect and a reverence for the original language and the way that the original audience heard it. All right, so we go from behind the text to within the text to now facing the text. So we talked about historical background, we talked about the, the background context, we talked about looking at the actual text itself and saying, what's here? Who are the characters? What's the plot? What's the, the, the setting? You know, are there any kind of literary devices going on? That was just all the words and the sentences in front of you. But there's another layer. It's not just the background, it's not just the text. We are in 2021 in upstate South Carolina in the United States of America, and we're reading an English Bible, and we're bringing so many preconceptions about life and what's normal. Um, we're bringing all of that stuff into the text, and so we have to acknowledge the fact that we are not in a vacuum. We don't have a perfect picture to the past, and we're also maybe distorted in how we think about what we're reading because of where we are today. So you have to acknowledge it up front. So the big question is, um, or one of the big questions is facing the text, for whom might this text be relevant today? Are we talking about the fact that it's relevant for everybody? Um, not necessarily everywhere in scripture. Genesis is kind of different in that it's, um, it's the beginning of the whole story. It's the beginning of Genesis, but it's also the beginning of the entire Bible. It's the beginning of the history of mankind and the story of God. And so, it's pretty easy for us to see that, yes, uh, this probably would be relevant for everybody reading it today because it's, it's talking about the conflict and the crisis for all of humanity with God. So this is for everybody. But let's get a little bit more granular. So thinking from where we are as modern readers today, what are some of the messages from or about God that we can take from this text um, in our time and place? What are some messages from or about God that modern believers can take from this text in their time and place? Um, it may be you read this and you're like, well, God's mean. Why did he kick him out? Especially if you have like a, a traumatic relationship with your earthly father, you might be like, well, 
that's a mean God. Like I don't understand why he would why he would kick them out. I mean, they only screwed up once, right? Um, why would he kick them out of the garden, preventing them from eating the tree of life? Wouldn't that be a good thing? Like if they ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and all this stuff, all this bad stuff happened. What's going on when he kicks them out of the garden and says you can't come back in and the ground is cursed and childbirth is going to be a lot more difficult and your relationship is going to be at odds? Why would he not just let them come back in and eat from the tree of life? That's questions that modern readers readers would have that maybe the original audience didn't. Is there anything in this text that might be open to challenge or questioning by a modern reader? How about the whole thing? Um, I would say a a large um, segment of secular worldview says that there's you know there's nothing wrong with mankind. All all people are inherently good. You know some people just get kind of screwed up based on their upbringing or based on their um, life experience, um, but most people are really good. And this Genesis three, if we go later on into the Bible, it's used as the pinnacle of conflict. Uh, it sets up the entire rest of the, the story. I mean, Genesis 3 doesn't happen. Jesus doesn't need to come. <laughs> this is the conflict that really sets the tone for the rest of the entire biblical narrative. And um, if, if, if mankind really isn't that bad, then there's no need, no need for Jesus. And so, you know, I think that a lot of um, uh, atheist, agnostic, uh, just secular worldview proponents would say that, you know, this is really just kind of a fable. It's not, it's not really real. Um, it didn't really happen. So that's one of the ways that uh, it could be called into question. What factors make it possible for modern readers to bring this text, uh, to bring to this text interpretations not intended by the author? What factors make it possible for us to bring to the text interpretations that were not intended by the original author. I mean, time, <laughs> we're, we're thousands of years displaced from when this happened, uh, if not millions. Let's, you know, let's just throw that out there. There's conflicting ideas about the, the way and the, the, the chronology. It's a long time, regardless of how you cut it. Um, there's time, there's culture, um, there's geography. Like we're in upstate South Carolina, we have like rolling hills. That those were mountains there, um, and you have to understand like it's a it's a different world there. And maybe Genesis three doesn't really show how that works, but um, as we get further on into Genesis, you're going to see that geography, topography, the wilderness, they're all going to play a major role in the setting, and and you're going to see how important that is to understanding the rest of the story. So uh, chronology. Uh, context, history, geography, there's a lot of things that can make it to where we don't, we unintentionally uh, bring an interpretation that's not really there. All right, here we go again. How might gender, culture, life experience, or including experiences with religion or religious groups affect the way a modern reader might respond to this text? How can the experience of a reader add to the richness of interpretation? Well, it's kind of already happened. Um, so not every Bible teacher has been to the Middle East, has been to Egypt and Israel and Sinai in between. I've been there, I can bring a little bit of at least a description of what it looks like, what it smells like, um, uh, how it feels to ride a camel up to what's believed to be Mount Sinai. I've got photos. Um, depending on who is reading it, you have a different set of experiences that can add to the richness or uh, subtract from it if you don't have that kind of experience. Um, so in some ways what we bring could be a good thing, but you just have to acknowledge it. Um, I don't think Don has been to Israel or Egypt, and so he has an amazing frame of reference from Guatemala and the life experiences that he has there. He lived there for five years with his family. I don't have that. And so what he brings, it, it might not be with a biblical backdrop, but it's a complete different worldview, and so we have to call it out up front, and a lot of times you'll hear him talk about those experiences, and they add richness to uh, God's Word. They add richness to his messages. Continuing with this facing the text, how might a modern reader gain a deeper awareness of this text? This is really just saying, if you want to go deeper, you want to understand, 
how to, how to really do the backdrop, the behind the text and in the text. How can we have like a periscope back to that time? What are some tools that we can use? Um, exploration of different translations of the text. That might seem a little odd. Everybody got their favorite Bible, the NIV, the ESV. Um, sometimes it's good just to compare and contrast because um, the different words, sometimes a, an editor chooses a word that essentially means the same thing, but the difference can kind of jump out at you and say, oh, I never thought about it like that before. So a different translation of the text, a substitution of alternate images or metaphors. Honestly, I don't know what that means. I can't think of how to make that work in our current text, but maybe that would work as well. Um, knowledge of background or context of the text. Well, again, you'd want to go to a commentary, a Bible dictionary, uh, or just a friend who has, you know, theological training uh, or who is a word nerd who really loves to go back to the ancient Greek or Hebrew. Um, go looking. <laughs> go, go searching. Uh, let's see. This is an interesting one. Exploration of the rich tradition of the church. Because Genesis 3 is such a pivotal moment in the whole story, probably a lot of church fathers, a lot of reformers, uh, a lot of church historians all will have takes on, on this particular scene, this particular moment. I did a Google search this week for um, Genesis 3 or for the man, the woman, and the serpent, and, and all sorts of images, all sorts of um, uh, artistic renderings of photos of the fall. I didn't include any of them on here because there's a lot of nakedness and, and uh, you know, that might impact people differently, but um, this is such an important, this is such an important moment in the life of the church, uh, and all sorts of different time frames have looked back on this and kind of given it their own interpretation. So what has the church tradition kind of spoken about this? Application of biblical criticism, I'm not going to get too heady here, it exists. Um, there are scholars out there that don't really focus on the essence of what's being um, Kind of shared. They want to. They want to look at. They want to get really, really um, into the the weeds on some of this stuff. You know, it's it's an entire you know industry. And if you want to get into it, you can. I think for the sake of just understanding and, and um, being equipped and inspired and uh, prepared for God's word this Sunday, you you may not need to go too deep into that stuff. Um, let's see, can a line be drawn between reliable and unreliable modern interpretations of the text? This is another one of those things where you just have to admit, I might be such a South Carolinian, you know, Bible Belt Christian that I don't really spend a lot of time looking at unreliable modern interpretations of the text, but I'm sure that they're out there. You can look at liberal theologians, you can look at um, people that are not even Christians that that look at this and say, oh, well, maybe it's a, you know, it's, it's not literal. It's, it's meant, it's all symbolic. Um, and, you know, that's, that's certainly a way to look at it, but, um, you have to say, well, is that the original author's intent is to just use a bunch of symbols to tell a fable? Or is this meant for something greater? Is this meant for something more? What else did Moses write? What else did Moses do? Uh, is, 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 is his story really just relegated to a fictitious fable account at the beginning. And then when does it change? When does he go from being just a, kind of a, a fable to actually being historical? Let's see, final question, does the church have a specific teaching about the meaning of this text? Yeah, the fall of mankind. Um, this is where it all falls apart. We all fall, we all fall down and then this is the fallout of the fall. So. Um, those consequences that Don is going to be preaching about this Sunday, those curses, um, it's not like they just impacted Adam and Eve. Romans is very clear. Paul says, you know, as death came through the world through one man, so life through uh, the, the new man through Christ. And so this really lays the groundwork for understanding the human conflict and getting the appetite, the need for Jesus to come and rescue and save. So yes, the church has a very specific teaching about the meaning of this text. This is where everything falls apart and the rest of the story is about God's great plan to, to fix it all, to make it all new. All right. So kind of a, 
you know, just another practical application. How might this text be used or applied in contemporary context today? Um, we could use it maybe in a call to worship, like Jesse could go ahead and read about the fall and it's not very inspiring, it's not very good for the good news, but it does kind of reset us and bring us to a place of contrition, brings us to a place of owning the fact that if I had been there, it's not like Adam blew it for everybody, Eve blew it for everybody. What this is basically saying is that we we would have done the same thing had we been there. They were representatives of, of mankind, but um, we would have played the same game and had the same outcome. How could we use this today for personal spiritual reflection, like guided prayer? Could you use this particular passage for that? I don't know. I think it'd be a little bit weird for me, but it's possible, yeah. To inspire action for justice, lots of places in the Bible probably, but I don't necessarily know if um, inspiring action for justice was the original author's intent. And if we use it, if we misuse it, we could probably make it um, stand for that today, but I don't think you have to kind of hold those in tension. Was that the original author's intent? Or are we eisegeting? To reassure, not much reassuring about this passage. To console, not really. To challenge or convict, um, for us to see ourselves at this place in the story and and own our own proclivity, our own natural tendency to, to sin, yeah, I think, I think that's the point, is for us to be able to see ourselves in that picture. To invite to belief, I mean, maybe in the sense of being so desperate, knowing that if this is the picture of humanity, and this is my picture, and this is the consequences, being separated from God, being kind of kicked out of his presence, being in some way dead spiritually, um, yeah, I mean, maybe it does. It's that it's that defining moment. It's that desperation uh, that that calls us to the divine. Um, could we rewrite this to engage a particular audience? Yeah, we could. Um, I don't know how that would look, but I think it would take a good creative to to kind of rewrite this in 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 modern you know modern language, modern clothing. I don't know how that would look, but I'm sure it could probably minister to somebody that way. Okay, so finally, we're we're kind of at the at the end of the study. So we select the passage first, we study the passage, we ask all those questions about the world behind the text, the world within the text, and then the world facing the text, us. Um, so then what's the big idea? Like if the original author had um, an idea in his mind that he was trying to communicate, he was trying to transmit to his audience those uh, Israelites that are on the move, that are going through Mount Sinai, that are that are going through the wilderness. He's trying to tell them about God. What's the big idea? What is he trying to tell them? What is he trying to communicate to that audience? We're not trying to jump right to what does it mean to me now. We're trying to say what was the original author trying to communicate to his audience way back then? What's the big idea? The exegetical idea. Exegesis is, is the the science, uh, the process of trying to figure out what the message was in the original context. It's not trying to translate it to today. It's trying to just isolate way back then and there uh, what was the meaning. So when we talk about the exegetical idea, this is kind of fun. You can do this for literally every time you read the Bible, every time you hear a sermon. Um, you can look at the subject, the complement, and the uh, exegetical idea or the big idea. Um, now the subject is always stated in the form of a question. This is kind of like what the author is talking about. So if we wanted to go ahead and take a stab at, at, at it today, we'd say, you know, what is the author saying are the consequences of the fall? The author being Moses or whoever it is anonymously. So what does the author say are the consequences of the fall? So that's the subject. That's what the author is talking about. What are the, what's the author saying are the consequences of the fall? The complement is the answer to that question. It's a statement or <laughs> an indirect statement. So the complement uh, would be God pronounces a curse on the serpent, multiplied pain in childbirth, and a diverted desire and relationship for the woman and the man, uh, a curse on the ground, and a command to work the cursed ground uh, for survival on the man. So the snake gets cursed, the woman has um, multiplied childbirth pain in a weird relationship with her husband. The man has a um, 
the ground on which he works is cursed and he's kind of uh, relegated to work that cursed ground in order to kind of make things make ends meet uh, whereas God had provided and given everything now it's up to the man to make it happen if it's gonna be it's up to me um, essentially that whole mentality is a result of being separated from God kicked out of the garden whereas God had provided all those things before um, they're all kind of taken away they're all marred they're mutated it's not the it's not the original plan so um, oh, we just got to the end okay well let's go back to me so I would say the big idea is um, Moses says that the fallout the consequences for the fall are the curse on the serpent the hardship for the woman both through childbirth and a weird relationship with her husband and for the man it's this um, recipe for workaholism it's this recipe for um, not being okay but having to do in order to make sure everything's okay um, and ultimately the, the greatest consequence is um, separation from God being kicked out of the presence of God and not allowed back in it it's kind of like the Empire Strikes Back in Star Wars this ends on a really down note it seems like there's no this is the absence of good news it's just the consequences of the fall um, I'm really looking forward to see where Don goes this week um, he's going to be focused, I think, on those uh, consequences and maybe the responses of the man and the woman. The serpent's very quiet, but, you know, Eve has her response, Adam has his response, and then God has his own response to everything. So it should be a great time of worship and making much of God's word. Thank you for joining me. Um, next week, I think we're actually moving on to chapter four. Uh, sometimes we'll have to double down and just stay in the same um, passage for a couple weeks just to really get under it. But um, we should be in chapter four next week. I'll be back next Wednesday at noon to kind of take the baby steps into the scriptures. And if you have any questions about this, you can always reach out uh, to me at jacob at eternalchurch.net. If you'd like to join and kind of converse through this, uh, we haven't opened it up to a Zoom conversation yet, but I'd be, I'd be down for doing that. And if you didn't catch this live, but you're watching it after the fact, then uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we will make sure that this stays up on the Facebook page for a while. Have a great afternoon. Hope you enjoyed your lunch, and I hope you prepare your heart for the feast that is to come on Sunday. Uh, we love you, church, and we will talk with you soon. Bye.